All right, I just want to make sure that everyone is seeing the right screen. Uh, currently, you should be seeing the seal of Florida. <laughs> Here yes. is the, the top. Great. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you all for being uh, with me today on such a well, for Florida crisp morning here in January. Uh, I am the E-Rate and Director Connections Consultant here with the Bureau of Library Development in the Division of Library and Information Services. And today I'll be talking a little bit about uh, the <clears throat> the E-Rate program for funding year 2021. And I appreciate you all uh, bearing with me as we are getting some technical issues straightened out. Uh, I will be discussing the federal E-Rate program here today, both the fundamentals of the program and what that can mean for uh, public libraries throughout Florida, especially with uh, any updates and budgetary changes for this year. So, what exactly is E-Rate? This refers to the program that's overseen by the Federal Communications Commission. In the mid-90s, when the internet was becoming more prevalent in education and business, everything was being run uh, over phone lines via dial-up modem. This resulted in skyrocketing costs uh, for internet connectivity, and at that time, schools and libraries had a difficult time keeping up. The E-Rate program was created by Congress in 1996 to combat this need as a way to eliminate financial barriers that stand in the way of educate, education and equity. If you've ever looked at your cable or phone bill and seen a universal service fee at the bottom, this is part of what that money goes to fund. USAC, or the Universal Service Administrative Company, is the office that administers that fund for the FCC. They are located out of DC, and they actually work with several separate programs. Um, but the one that I'll be discussing today is just the Schools and Libraries E-Rate program. Since I'm the Bureau of Library Development's consultant, I will be talking about, well, you guessed it, the library aspect of the E-Rate program. I'm guessing if you've signed up for this webinar, you're interested in that as well. USAC has mainly delegated the task of determining if a library qualifies for E-Rate funds to the individual state library administrative agencies. Um, I've included a screenshot there of the minimum uh, statutory definition of library or library consortium uh, definition that they use. In Florida, we use the following criteria to define a public library as eligible for LSTA funding. Uh, just to go down this list, um, Florida, a library must be headed by a librarian that has completed a, an education program that's accredited by the American Library Association. There must be an organized collection of information resources, whether hard copy or digital. There must be paid staff, have separate quarters, be open to the public during regularly scheduled hours, and be supported in whole or in part with public funds. And the question that I'm sure some of you are going to ask right now is, what about bookmobiles? So in Florida, we define a bookmobile as a traveling branch of a library system, a trucker van that carries an organized collection of library materials and is operated by paid staff, not just volunteers, and open to the public during regularly scheduled hours. Uh, in the case of this last point, uh, we just mean posted stops. There's no minimum number of hours to be open or anything to qualify as a bookmobile. So for this year, there is actually an update on bookmobiles um, for E-Rate funding year 2021. They announced back in November of 2020 that bookmobiles must have square footage listed in their entity profile. Um, 
I just want to highlight that as that's new guidelines, uh, USAC is requiring that every branch of a library system, regardless of bookmobile or just a, a branch library, must have an entry for square footage in their system. If this section is left blank in your profile, um, and we will get to profiles a little bit later, but if that section is left blank, they will not consider it for funding. Now, if you have put in your square footage and then you are later asked to uh, supply proof, the guidance that I have been given is that all good faith attempts will be accepted. If your bookmobile was purpose built, then a copy of your spec sheet from your manufacturer or the auto shop that did the um, perhaps the installations. However, if it's more, say, an aftermarket or creative creation, uh, you can even just submit pictures of you or your staff taking measurements and that will be accepted as, as proof. So I've spoken about the qualifications necessary. Now it's time for me to actually tell you what you can get with your E-rate funds. They're generally divided up into two main categories. Category one covers the costs of getting the internet from your service provider to your building, whether it's done via fiber, cable, or even via satellite or via TV white space, the cost of transmission to your facility. Um, category two is for funding all the other costs of network services inside your library and its branches. This can be the cost of your routers, your switches, range extenders, uh, any and all equipment needed to connect your terminals and your other access points, as well as you or your patrons, you know, wireless devices. It can also be used to pay for maintenance and upkeep of those same services. As I think I've mentioned before, the E-rate program is an educational tool. Uh, it's intended to be used to supplement wherever the need is greatest. The way that they calculate need is based on local poverty rates as determined by the number of students in a given school district that are eligible for the National School Lunch Program. This is actually tracked by the Department of Agriculture and really for libraries, you'll have very little to do with the actual uh, determination of the, the discount rate or that percentage. You can see here in this table, the percentage of students that are eligible for school lunch, as well as where your library is located, um, are directly translated into the percentage of your internet connectivity bill that is eligible for reimbursement. So if you're looking closely, you will see some small differences of um, between libraries of urban or rural status. Uh, that is simply because there is generally judged to be a slightly higher cost with getting internet connectivity to rural libraries. And they wanted to recognize that in funding rates. Now, copy of this table is available at that URL at the bottom of the page. And I will say, if you can't capture these right now, I will be sending out these slides um, and some of these resources after the webinar. So don't worry if you can't go and, and grab that right now, I'll send it to you. So as for what you can use E-rate funds to pay for, all eligible services are ruled on by an FCC committee in a hearing each year. If you'd like to look at this year's lists of eligible services, that link will take you to the document summing up this year uh, for funding year 2021. I would like at this moment to address a question I get frequently, especially in 2020 and 2021 which is, are circulating hotspots eligible for E-rate reimbursement? At this time, the FCC's ruling is that Wi-Fi hotspots are only eligible for E-rate coverage if they are used on-site, I'll repeat that, on-site, to enhance the connectivity in your school or library or in one of your mobile branches. I know that this has been a perennial question, and I can simply say that these meetings are open for public comment, and several advocacy groups have made their voices heard on this matter, but so far the FCC has not ruled a circulating hotspots eligible for E-rate coverage. I'd like to take a moment now and pause to see if anyone has any questions before we move on.
as a reminder, if you have questions, you can type them in the chat or you can click that hand raise button and we will gladly unmute your mic. I will say that we have had grants that have been applied for and approved in the last couple of years as part of either our state LSTA program or last summer as part of our CARES Act funding program that included circulating hotspots as part of libraries disaster preparedness plans or their outreach services or part of closure plans and and those have been uh, successful so just because e-rate won't cover it doesn't mean that that is the only um, source of funding that we uh, up here with VLD do make available. Oh, well, thank you, Katie. Yes. <laughs> I believe that's Walton County received an LSTA grant that covers the cost of some circulating hotspots. All right, so I've, I've covered E-rate uh, on a broad terms, and now I'm going to begin to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of app, um, application. So before you begin an application, I have several recommendations. They're not required, but just my personal recommendations about conversations you should ideally have. If you're in the middle of a contract with a service provider, that may impact your ability to participate in what's called competitive bidding. If you are just finishing one up, however, or are in a month to month or a year to year contract, then you're probably in the clear. So I would advise having a discussion with your service provider about where you are in your cycle. Uh, if it turns out that your county or town has stringent procurement policies, it's also best to know that at the outset before you start uh, putting out requests for bids. So I would say talk to your local procurement officer to find out what the guidelines are that you need to follow. And if you are a new library director or if you're new to the role of systems librarian, then there's a possibility that there might be a technology improvement plan in place already. And having familiarity with it can really help you as you're putting together your request for bids. So I would say talk to your IT department to find out if your library has a technology plan in place. As a side note, I will be hosting a conversation with the people behind the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit, which is a walkthrough of how to analyze your library's IT setup and get up to speeds to be able to uh, compose a technology plan. So I will be actually hosting that conversation later in the spring. So keep an eye out for that, just as a little bit of promotion here. And then lastly, if you've never applied for E-rate before, you will probably want to have a conversation with your board or your advisory group about SIPA. So what is SIPA? I'm so glad you asked. SIPA or SIPA, as I've also heard it pronounced, so it can really go both ways. Uh, stands for the Children's Internet Protection Act. Uh, the link there at the bottom of the screen is to look at the actual language of the act itself. Compliance with SIPA is a requirement for E-rate participation. So I am sometimes asked by people who are navigating the E-rate process if I can recommend a filter or if there's an approved list of filters. As a state agency, I really can't recommend one product over another, but what I can do is provide a link to this survey that we conduct every year. Uh, the survey is sent out to all public library directors and responses include a list of what filters they use. And so if you have questions about experiences that library staff have had with these services, I would be happy to put you in contact with those respondents and you can kind of get together and compare notes. So E-rate requirements state that the internet filter must be installed on all computers, not just the ones in the children's area, which includes all public facing computers as well as staff computers. However, the filter can be turned off 
at the request of a patron for, and I quote here, bona fide research purposes, although they do leave the procedure for making that request up to your individual discretion, as well as uh, what constitutes bona fide. I know that the balance of patron privacy versus security is a tricky one for our profession, so I really leave it up to your, you and your policy guidelines. I would make sure that you are enforcing them equally and that you have some form of written policy um, just so that you can you know, be very clear, um, but that is really up to you with a local decision. The default does need to be that the filter is turned on and can be turned off at request, not the other way around. Finally, in order to be SIPA compliant, you will need to announce and host a public meeting or hearing to discuss SIPA and um, filtering. You can do that as part of a monthly or quarterly regularly scheduled meeting to discuss library business as long as it's announced and perhaps on the agenda. And because I'm talking to you guys now from the year 2021, there is nothing in the rule that says that this meeting must be held face to face. So a virtual meeting is just fine for these purposes. If you are ever audited, they may ask to see a copy of your security log, which is perhaps where you were keeping track of the times you were asked to remove the filter for research purposes. Um, and so having that security log will really come in handy. I still have not heard of libraries being visited for site checks, but they announced last year that they were increasing efforts to do those. Um, so perhaps they'll step those up after the current state of affairs ends. And if this is your first year filing for E-rate, you do not have to be SIPA compliant in your first year. But if you've ever filed before in the past, um, even if it was 10 years ago uh, or three years ago, that would count as your first filing year. And, and last, but, um, yes. Um, I do see that Katie's hand is up. So I, Katie, I have unmuted you. So you need to unmute yourself, but feel free if you have a question or a comment. Okay, quick question. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Um, Emily, how often does that have to be repeated, that public, um, the public announcement? Um, is that something that's only required at the beginning of your service, or is there a time frame where that needs to be repeated? I am so glad you asked that question. Uh, you only have to do it once. Um, I would advise if that, excuse me, <clears throat> if that public meeting or that hearing was held and you have perhaps a sign-in sheet, copy of the agenda, uh, keep a copy of those in your E-rate uh, file so that if you're ever asked, you can show uh, proof that that meeting did occur, but you really only have to do it once, no matter how long ago it was. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for asking. All right, um, one last point. If your library system uh, consists of more than one branch, each branch must have a filter in place. You can't just have it, for instance, at your main branch uh, and, and call that good enough. All right, I know that SIPA is really a, a big concept, so I will ask if there are any more questions. And Katie, thank you again for yours because um, that was really something I should have mentioned. All right, this graphic is a gift from our friends over at the Department of Management Services that I have uh, very kindly, they've lent me. So I know that there are a lot of moving parts here and I will spend the next little bit of this uh, webinar kind of breaking it down. Now, the metaphor that works best for me personally is that E-rate is like a garden. Um, if you try to do everything all at once and just in one big push, you're going to just exhaust yourself and probably end up making a mess. Uh, instead, think of everything as having its season. There may be times when you are having to do things in different areas of E-rate um, and other part, times of the year when things are lying fallow. Um, but if you are patient and, and work on it throughout the year, uh, you will have a lot more success. And um, to borrow an old joke, you'll have a lot more green. All 
All right, how to apply. This is an example here of the landing page for the E-Rate Productivity Center, also known as EPIC. So if you hear me reference EPIC, I'm actually referring to this website. If you're wondering where to start, the phone number there at the bottom of the screen is where you will call to receive a login for your library's E-Rate Productivity Center page. If your library has never filed before, or if you're new to your system and you need to be added to the account, the people at the um, Customer Support Bureau will be able to walk you through the process of getting set up and authenticating that. Everything related to E-Rate really happens in the EPIC portal. And because I'm a very visual learner and a very visual planner, I have found a lot of flowcharts to be helpful for me. Uh, I found this one to be particularly handy for figuring out where you are in the process from season to season and where you're supposed to be in the yearly cycle. And I will send a copy of this out to everyone after the webinar. I actually have one printed out and hung above my desk just for my own um, edification and clarity from time to time. So if you have been in government for a bit, you're probably familiar with the term request for proposals or RFP. USAC does not require that you do a formal request for proposals, but your local procurement policy may. So this is why I suggested earlier that you want to have a talk with your procurement officers. Now, if you have done an RFP, you will be required to upload it into the Productivity Center, that's EPIC, so that all internet providers can see it and consider it when making uh, putting together their bid proposals. Then you will file the Form 470 so that all those internet providers can see it. And that's how you request bids for your library service needs. Unfortunately, there are not snappy nicknames or acronyms for these forms. Each is just referred to by its federal form number. So. Form 470s get filed in EPIC and service providers go there to see your requests. One note about Florida, I know that the realities of this state mean that we have a lot of pretty rural counties and that in some of these areas, there may only be one service provider. And if that's the case, you still need to file that Form 470 and wait the required amount of time. But then you can reach out to them directly after the 28 day waiting period has passed. Also, if you're in the middle of a multi-year contract, if you did a Form 470 at the start of the process, you don't have to do one each year. You just have to wait until that contract elapses and then perhaps do another one. You are not obligated to do that formal um, RFP unless you're required to locally. And if you're ever caught between local procurement guidelines and our state or federal ones, USAC always defers to whatever the most stringent is. I also recommend that when you're putting out your Form 470 and you're describing the needs of your library, that you would avoid brand names and discussion of specific products. This avoids the issue of, say, you were to specify that you want the Cisco Uplink 5K or the AT&T 5G Onyx router. Those are just made up. Those are not real products, by the way. Um, but for instance, a service provider doesn't do business with Cisco or AT&T or have those specific models, then you wouldn't be excluding a vendor inadvertently when you were just, for instance, trying to give examples. And this last point here on the calendar is, I'm um, sorry, on this slide is very important, the 28 day waiting period. Since we are now in the application window, it actually opened January 15th and closes March 25th. That means if you submit a Form 470 today, you would have to wait until February 28th to begin the next phase of application. They are very strict about that 28 day waiting period. So just be aware of that. One of the cornerstones of the E-Rate program is the need for fair and competitive bidding. Before and after you have filed your Form 470 in EPIC, requesting services, you are required to conduct business with prospective service providers in a very transparent and open fashion. I strongly suggest that you conduct as much communication as possible with the vendors in EPIC. 
where any questions and answers are public and can be seen by any other vendors as well. Alternately, if a question is asked, you would um, have to find a way to make the question and your response available to other service providers, which kind of seems like a headache to me. <clears throat> In a normal year, this would be the point where I would stress that free upgrades to services or you know, the gift of additional hotspots or anything of that nature um, fall into the category of gifts, which are strictly not allowed in the program. However, this is not a normal time period. And USAC actually announced last year that uh, said, essentially in light of the extraordinary needs for technology, for distance learning currently, they were waiving that program rule. Originally, they had only waived it through June, 2020, but they have since put out extensions a couple of times. So currently, like as of today, that rule expires on June 30th, 2021. And schools and libraries are allowed to accept or even solicit gifts from service providers. <clears throat> so I have some recommendations here, only one of which is actually a program rule, which is the last one. Um, however, the other ones are just sort of recommendations from me to you. Um, when it comes time to collect bids that came in as a result of your form, uh, your form 470, and make the decision about which provider you go with, it's a good idea to have multiple points of view and also to have a documentation of your process. And price should be the primary consideration, but not the only consideration. You can actually uh, make any particular uh, point that you wanna consider part of your evaluation process, as long as you weight price the most heavily. What am I talking about when I talk about evaluation? This grid is an example of what that evaluation process uh, can look like. You can have other factors that are uh, considered. One that I've heard of often is that many Florida libraries uh, include that they want a vendor to be flexible on their invoicing so that they can get the most out of that profit per <clears throat> excuse me, that process for the purposes of state aid. And I'll explain a little bit more about that when we get to invoicing. The category with the most points assigned, as you can see there, is lowest cost, so that you can certify that you made cost effectiveness a key factor in your decision, but it does not have to be the sole consideration, just the one that's weighted the most heavily. I do suggest that you keep a copy of it and anyone else's who was in your selection group uh, in your documentation for E-Rate, just in case you get a program integrity assurance question about that later on. You also have the option to use the Department of State's, sorry, the Department of Management Services State Master Term Contract, the link for which is located there at the bottom of the slide. These are some pre-negotiated rates that DMS has gotten and libraries can opt in on those. So here's that flow chart again. If you're following along, this would be the point in the process where you had put out a request for bids and you've received one or more, conducted a bid evaluation, possibly using a bid matrix um, to select a vendor that you want to go with and you're ready now to apply for funds. And I will pause here and ask if anyone has questions over the items that um, process that I've already discussed. Emily, I'm not seeing any hand raises. All right, thank you, Casey. All right, move on. So application for discounts. So in this part of the process, you had selected a vendor and you're ready to apply for funds. There are no more restrictions on how you can contact a vendor. So at this point, I do actually recommend that you reverse that earlier uh, policy of only contacting them via EPIC and actually be in pretty free communication just so that you have familiarity with them and you can pick up the phone and get someone on the line with any fine detail questions you might have about your application. 
I had mentioned this earlier, but I'll reiterate here, the dates for applications actually opened last week on January 15th at noon, and the filing window will close at midnight on March 25th, which means that you could file right now if you're ready. And if you're not ready yet, the last day that you could file your Form 470 requesting bids is February 28th, so that you could file it and still wait the mandatory 28 days. I also want to emphasize that after you have selected a vendor and are preparing to apply for services, you're free and clear to discuss service details with them. So contract information, service start date, et cetera. The actual form that is used to apply for discounts is the 471. There's a link there to more details uh, about the Form 471 at the bottom of the slide here. Within that form, there's a further breakdown of funding requests, each one being given its own ID number. And I have seen some systems where the account administrator has everything under one funding request number and some systems where services at each branch have, it own, have its own. It's really a personal choice or local decision. And just like with the Form 470, the Form 471 is filed in EPIC. I'd like to talk now about billing and invoicing. Technically, this is a later step in the process, but it's a good discussion to have at this point. I really recommend it as it's something you want to have discussed with your service provider before everything is signed and sealed and the contract is you know, completely in place. There are two different ways of receiving reimbursement. There's the BEAR, which has nothing to do with large animals. It stands for Build Entity Applicant Reimbursement, and SPY, which stands for Service Provider Invoicing. Using the BEAR method, your library would be paying for its bill in full all year and then turning around at the end of the year and invoicing USAC for the amount covered by your discount sort of like buying something in the store and then sending in for the manufacturer's rebate. Uh, in the SPY method, that's primar primarily handled by your internet service provider. They invoice USAT for the discount that they give you each month. So you'll only see the bill for the non-discounted portion, whatever that might be. That would be like, for instance, a particularly good coupon, the sort you would get in the mail and then set aside for the next time you go to the store. Ultimately, it's a local decision each method has its advantages or disadvantages. Some people prefer the SPY um, simply because it really relieves pressure on the library to come up with the whole total uh, cost of their internet bill each month. And then other libraries can have told me in the past that they prefer the bear method because then they pay for the, the internet bill and get the reimbursement check, but all the fat funds they spent count on their uh, local expenditures for the purposes of state aid. Again, purely a local decision and one that you technically don't have to make at this time uh, until it come, it's time to do a, a later step in the process. But it's a good idea to have the conversation early with your service provider and rather than getting a surprise later on. You can actually make it part of your bidding criteria or even part of your bid evaluation matrix if you want. So, PIA, I know I had mentioned this earlier, Program Integrity Assurance Review um, is after the application for discounts. Um, this is when you're going to get inquiries from a person employed by USAC on the details of your application. And I wanna give you some tips here to make sure that this process goes as smoothly as possible. Inquiries come in via the EPIC portal and you have 15 days, that's calendar days, not business days, uh, to respond to any questions. So make sure that you're checking the EPIC portal pretty regularly during the time period in question. They also have questions sometimes about the bidding process. So this is where having documentation about say your bid evaluation matrix comes in handy. Uh, and also it might be really helpful to be able to call someone at your service provider uh, really quickly in case a question comes in and you have to respond. They also might have questions um, about any other part of your process. Uh, communication with them is really key. 
They'll compare your funding request to this year's eligible services list, and you'll be required to certify that you have the ability to pay the whole bill or the non-discounted share uh, for services that aren't eligible for E-rate coverage. This is one of those check boxes that sometimes people overlook, and I want to make sure that it's really clear that I pointed that out. So funding commitments, congratulations. If you've done everything and you've gotten through to this point, you will have a funding commitment. Um, FCDLs or funding commitment decision letters are issued solely in the uh, E-Rate Productivity Center. Used to be in the old days, they were sent via hard copy. Uh, now they're only in Epic. They'll be under the news feed section in your account and you'll wanna review it carefully in case there are changes that deviate from the application you filed. Once you've received a funding commitment and you're approaching the point, the funding year where services are due to start, we move along to the next phase in this handy chart. That, I did not actually intend that to rhyme. That's terrible, I'm sorry. So after services start, there is, um, you guessed it, yet another form. This one is called the Form 486. It confirms that your services started on the date that you fill in and that your library is compliant with SIPA. You don't have to have this done uh, within 120 days of your service start date, but USAC will come along behind you and adjust your funding request date. So I would recommend to make sure you're fully covered for reimbursement. It's really best to get that Form 486 filed in within a couple of months of your, your service start date. For a lot of libraries in Florida, that's uh, July 1, but it really can vary uh, depending on the contract you've signed with your service provider. All right. This seems like another good place to stop and ask if anyone has any questions about funding commitments and um, some of the processes that I've, I've outlined. All right, if no one has any, then I'll move ahead and discuss invoicing. So here's that chart again. I refer to it an awful lot and I wanna make sure you guys get a chance to as well. So I had mentioned this earlier when I was discussing applying for discounts, but this is the point where you actually have to file the form talking about invoicing. Bear or build entity applicant reimbursement is the one that I compared to a mail-in rebate before. So here's a list of the things that you need to have in order to file a bear. You'll have to have your funding commitment decision letter saying that they decided to give you money, uh, approving your form 471. You need to have your form 486, uh, which was your certification that your services were started and that you were in compliance with SIPA. You'll need to have services delivered and paid for in full and a form 98 certifying that your payment details are correct in EPIC. Now, what is a Form 98, you ask? These, this particular form confirms all details that your financial information are correct in EPIC. This is a lot of money on the table, so they want to make sure it's going to the right place. Uh, payment, for those of you who might not have filed in a while, comes as a direct deposit to your bank account. They're no longer sending checks through the mail. It also will arrive no more than 120 days after the last date of service. So you won't be waiting around for those funds forever. There is some more information about how to uh, look up the form 498 in that link there. SPY or service provider invoicing is the method that I compared to a coupon before. This is really handled more in the service provider end, although USAC may ask one or both of you to provide documentation that the non-discounted amount of bills was paid. You will still need that funding commitment decision letter and your form 46, but the service provider will file the form 474 to receive reimbursement, and you should have been seeing a reduced amount on your bill for the year.
Some things I really wanna emphasize here as you're going through this process. So the retention period for all relevant documents is 10 years after the last date of service. So if you receive funding for funding year, say 2020, and your services <clears throat> started last year uh, on July 1st, 2020 and ran until June 30th, 2021, you would need to keep documentation on that year's application, all your billing and filtering documents and everything until 2031 which is really hard to fathom, I know. Uh, at any given point, you may be dealing with up to three years of E-rate. You could be dealing with the reimbursement from last year, this year's services and billing and applying for next year. So really having the right documentation and getting into the habit of keeping it consistently organized is the key to keeping it all straight. And lastly, the other point I wanna emphasize is I am here to help. It's my goal, it's my purpose, it's my job. So if you get confused or you have questions, please pick up the phone or write me an email. It really is um, something that I'm very, very happy to do. All right, I've kind of covered the overall E-rate process and I'd like to address uh, some, some current updates. There are some relatively recent developments. The eligible services list was released there uh, on November 30th, 2020. I've included the link there and I'll send it out again after the webinar. The funding for category two has been permanently adopted. So currently, and uh, at least for the next five years, the funding year is set for five-year income rents. Um, so they have reset the funding period for 2021 to 2025. What does that mean exactly? All libraries, regardless of rural or urban status, will now receive $4.50 per square foot. For those of you who have maybe filed in the past and have some other memories, they used to have a very different set of standards for urban versus rural libraries. Now they have just sort of averaged the two and it's $4.50 per square foot of your library facilities for the per category two budget. It's not for overall internet services, just the part of the program that covers uh, internal connections. This number will be adjusted yearly for inflation. And Formerly, the funding floor per entity had been one, uh, sorry, $10,000. Um, and this year it has been changed to $25,000. And I should state this is not the funding maximum, this is just the minimum that your library system can receive per branch. So it can actually be much more than that depending on what your uh, overall square footage is. Does anyone have any questions about this? I should state that that uh, funding floor per entity also includes bookmobiles. So this is an overall uh, amount of money that could be applied to, for instance, an increase in outside services and connectivity to support those services. So I just wanna reiterate that that's really important and can have um, a major impact for Florida libraries. And Emily, Cindy does have her hand up. So Cindy, I have unmuted you, so feel free to go ahead and speak. Okay, can you hear me? I can, hi, how are you? I'm good. I just, can you just explain again the funding floor per entity? I'm not exactly sure what that means. Sure, um, yeah, floor is, is really their terminology. Basically, we know that, especially in Florida, you can have anything up to, from, you know, a thousand square feet up to, you know, some, some of our library branches in Florida can be you know, 150,000 square feet or more. Um, so for those smaller branches, the minimum that category two budgets would normally cover at that $4.50 per square foot uh, number would really be honestly, a, a smaller amount that might not um, I see. be worth it. I see. Before. Sure. So it, it has to do with like really small. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, that just is the minimum that it, that you could receive per uh, branch. I has been changed from ten thousand dollars in the previous uh, five year period, um, right. and now the minimum is twenty five thousand dollars. I got it. I got it. All right, that's good. Thank you. Yes. I find this to be a very, you know, just personally speaking, a very positive development showing that USAC is being proactive about right. wanting to support um, smaller libraries and uh, mobile branches. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really quite pleased to hear that. And I should state again that that is not an annual um, amount of money that is at the total for that five year period, but it really is a totally local decision whether or not um, you know you guys would prefer to, for instance, spend all that money up front doing a a big upgrade push, or if you'd like to you know allocate it out to cover a certain amount every year. For instance, if that's you know contracted services with your service provider to do you know maintenance and upkeep throughout that five year period. Totally local decision about how you want to spend that money, and, and um, so I certainly know. We'll probably have more questions about that moving forward. Are there any other questions? And Kimberly has her hand up. So Kimberly, I have unmuted you. Thank you. Um, yes, um, I'm Kimberly Ball. I'm at West Florida Public Libraries, and I know my director knows a lot about E-Rate. We've been doing it for a few years, but I'm, I'm just learning. Um, and one of the questions I have is we already have seven branches and a few community centers where we have small libraries um, that are covered by E-Rate. We are in the process of building a new building. I wonder what, what planning do we need to do as far as timing to have E-rate coverage for the new building? Oh, wow. So that is um, possibly a question that we will probably need to address off this, this webinar, just because I think that there's probably a lot of a lot of conversations you and I will need to have, because you can apply E-rate services uh, towards construction of facilities. Um, so right. To yeah, no, I was just saying when I was just wondering, like when we finally do have the building built, when do we apply? When do we start adding that branch? Where in the cycle would we add that branch when when it's built? Um, well, you can apply for E-rate funds um, prior to the building being completed okay. uh, so that you can receive those funds for to cover construction. Uh, cost. There's actually a whole section of the website that I can direct you to regarding special construction of projects. Um, so you don't need to wait until the building is fully up and running. Um, however, we, yeah, we'll probably need to talk a little bit more about when would be the best time um, as we, have you guys already broken ground on the project or? No, actually the bid is supposed to open today. So. Oh, wow. Building. Yeah. <laughs> And it's been a process. We thought well, the building would already be built by now, but um, with COVID and everything, we've had a lot of delays. And um, finally today, the bid is supposed to be open. So we'll see. And then sometime this spring, we'll break ground and hopefully That's get so it funny. done. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I just wondered, I didn't know, do we need to wait till like next year? Do we kind of go based on when we think the building's going to be done and that kind of thing? So. I, yeah, I'm going to say thread the needle a little bit there because mm -hmm. um, this E-rate funding cycle will cover, you know, starting July 1, uh, 2021 and going to July, uh, June 30th, 2022. Okay. And so that'll it'll really depend on, you know, projected uh, date of operation or date of, okay. of opening. Mm -hmm. And I know that that in construction, that, that can be a very changeable date mm -hmm. it already has yeah because like i said we thought we'd already have it done by now but yeah here we are not even begun as le at least the groundbreaking so okay well actually let me move to the next slide here is my contact information and i okay. think you and i should probably have some more conversations about this um okay. and that really goes for everybody i know that i have just given you guys a huge amount of information quickly and that you may have more questions as with kimberly so um yeah 
please reach out to me. I am always willing and very, very happy to take calls and have conversations. Also, anyone who registered for this will receive the slides and a roundup of all the links I've included uh, later today. And we will upload the recording in case uh, you want to review it again later to our YouTube channel. All right, Kimberly, I, I will be talking to you very shortly, I expect. So okay. thank you, Emily. Yeah, no problem. All right, well, if we have no more questions, I'm going to wish you guys a very happy day and uh, enjoy, the, enjoy it, make the most of it. And um, all right, yes, you're welcome, guys. All right, uh, Cindy, she raised her hand, so Cindy, oh, yes. I uh, yes, I just wanted to to make sure. So you're sending this out, the recording, or you're sending out the um, the slides, the screens. I will be sending out uh, a link to the recording, as well as the slides and the roundup of uh, of all the links. Perfect. Uh, all of it. <laughs> all of it. Okay, great. Because I need it all. Okay, thank you. I like your style, Cindy. I'm like that too. Send me everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, now it's going to be interesting talking to my IT person. <laughs> That's going to be the great conversation. Yeah, I think really honestly, one of the, the best pieces of advice is, is have those conversations early, have them often. Um, I would love to, but they don't, uh, <laughs> they don't feel the same way. <laughs> Thanks. This has been great. The the it's been wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Do you have any other questions before we? No, I'm good. Mm -hmm.